I am Minakshi Jain. I am going to speak today on the Ram Janam Bhumi Babri Masjid dispute on which I have recently written a book. When the controversy first broke out, like many, many Hindus, I connected with the issue instinctively. I was not aware of the finer points involved. I began to study the subject only after the Allahabad High Court delivered its judgment on 30th September 2010. Some time after that, I came across a booklet written by the Aligarh Historians Forum. This was a complete indictment of the judgment. After reading this pamphlet, the thought that immediately came to my mind was, was it possible for a court to give such a flawed verdict? That compelled me to read the entire 5000 plus page judgment. It was a real eye-opener for me. The amount of evidence in support of the temple was absolutely overwhelming and the shifting stand of the pro bribery group that had all been completely missing in media reports on this debate. The entire debate in the media had in fact been dominated by historians of three universities. Uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University, Aligarh University and Delhi University and there was a stray participation from one or two other universities. All the historians who participated in this debate from these universities were of left orientation. Some of them were even members of the two communist parties, the CPI and the CPM. Yet they insisted that they were independent historians and they wanted to be recognized as independent historians and not left historians in all the debates on this issue. Uh, from the beginning, one uh, objective of the left historians was to discredit every cherished Hindu belief on Lord Ram and the significance of the Ramayana in the civilizational history of India. So what did they do? What did they say? They said that Ayodhya was a mythical city, that present day Ayodhya was actually originally a Buddhist stronghold, that uh, Ram worship was an 18th, 19th century phenomena, that Babri Masjid was built on vacant land and that the Hindu Muslim dispute on Ayodhya had actually been engineered by the British in colonial times. So, we will just take up uh, these views of theirs and find out how much depth there is or is there in anything to them on Ayodhya. They uh, said that Ayodhya was, import, was originally known as Saket and it was a Buddhist stronghold. But the point is that right from the beginning of Indian history, we do know of Buddhist, Jain and Hindu structures existing alongside at places like Mathura, Kashi. For example, Ayodhya was very sacred to the Buddhists because Buddha is believed to have preached there. The first and fourth Jain Tirthankars were also born in Ayodhya. Like Ram, Buddha and the Jain Tirthankars belong to the Ishwak clan. But over time, the Buddhist and Jain influence declined and Ram worship remained a living reality. Now, the identification of Ayodhya. We have early religious literature which clearly states that Ayodhya and Saket are one. And even in the Ramayan, uh, it is said that Lord Dashrath, he was the king of Ayodhya, his capital was Saket Nagar. The importance of uh, Ayodhya is also evident from the fact that Tulsi Das came from Banaras to start his work in the city of Ram's birth and on the day of Ram's birthday. Abul Fazl, who is the historian writing at the time of Akbar, even he in his Akbar Nama says that Ayodhya was revered as the birthplace of Lord Ram and at the time of Ram Naomi, a huge festival used to be organized over there. So, that is as far as 
Ayodhya, the identification of Saket with Ayodhya. It is also important to remember that in the popular memory, present day Ayodhya has always been identified as Ram's birthplace and no alternative location for Ayodhya has ever been suggested. Now we come to the importance of Valmiki Ramayana. The left historians, right from the time the controversy broke out, they have tried to underplay the importance of Valmiki Ramayana. And they have said that there are other Ramayans that were written in the ancient period which deserve as much importance as Valmiki Ramayana. And they cite, for example, three Buddhist Jatak tales and also Jain versions of the Ramayana. But Buddhist scholars, they all are unanimous that none of the Buddhist Jataks is earlier than Valmiki Ramayana. And the Jain Ramayans are also owing uh, their structure and everything to Valmiki Ramayana. So, Valmiki Ramayana is the earliest surviving evidence of the Ram Katha. Uh, Valmiki's Ramayana is the earliest surviving version of the Ram Katha. The religious significance of Ram evolved on the basis of his presentation in Valmiki Ramayana. And the evolution of Ram as the incarnation of Vishnu also derives from the way he is presented in Valmiki Ramayana. So now, having discussed these two points of the list, I would now like to discuss the evolution of the Ram cult. According to Sanskrit scholars, uh, in the ancient period, that is around 5th, 6th century BC, Akhyans or ancient ballads, they narrated the Ram Katha orally. The written version of this began about a century later and Valmiki composed his Ramayana in the 4th or 3rd century BC and even earlier dates have been given. According to the epigraphic, literary and sculptural evidence that we have, Ram worship was established fact by the 4th, 5th century AD and it was spread all over India. By that time, the evolution of Ram from epic hero to incarnation of Vishnu to supreme reality had been complete. So, by the 4th, 5th century AD, the literary, epigraphic and sculptural evidence shows that the Ram cult is all India, it is an established fact. Uh, there is a lot of evidence which I can cite to support this epigraphic, sculptural, literary but I do not want to get into that right now. What is important for me is to point out the impact of the Muslim invasions on the Ram cult and Ramayana. By the time the Muslim invasions began, the Ramayana had been deeply ingrained in the minds of the people. That is why two important Gurjara ruling houses who were in the forefront of the fight against the invaders, they styled themselves, they took the name Pratihar. Pratihar that means they traced their descent from Lakshman, Ram's younger brother who was asked by Ram to serve as the Pratihar, doorkeeper and not allow others to enter. So, two Gurjara ruling houses that were in the forefront of the fight against the invaders styled themselves Gurjara Pratihara that shows how much impact the Ramayan had on the minds of the people. It was in this medieval period also that we find the Ramayan story being told in the vernaculars. It is told in Tamil, Telugu, Kannad, Malayalam, Bengali, Gujarati, Marathi and so on. So, that is the second point. And two important developments take place, one in the north, one in the south. In the south, we have the Chola ruler, Aditya Chola. He, for the first time that we know of, invokes the concept of Kodand Ram. Kodand Ram means Ram with a bow. He also sets up a temple dedicated to Kodand Rameshwaram. This is the first such temple that we are aware of and he takes 
the title, himself takes the title of Kodand Ram. Why does he do that? Perhaps he is the first, first person to visualize the possibility of a political use of the Ramayana. In the north, follow up of this, we find that Hindu kings on the path of the Turkish armies, that means wherever the Turkish armies were going, the Hindu rulers on that path, they began to say that we are Ram incarnates, we are incarnations of Ram and we have returned to earth to complete Ram's work against demon forces. So, I can give the example of the Gujarat ruler Jayasimha Sidharaj, he took that title, Prithvi Raj Chauhan who is described as the last Hindu ruler of Delhi, he took that title and there were many other kings who started in their inscriptions referring to themselves as Ram Avatar. So, that is also a very important point that we need to take. Now, one other interesting development takes place at the time of the Turkish invasion that we find again Hindu kings on the path of the Turkish armies, they sponsor or themselves write very major dharma nibans. So, in this early medieval period following the Turkish invasions, we have a large amount of dharma nibans composed by the kings or sponsored by them. And what do they say? They talk about the need to reaffirm dharma at a time when dharma is under stress. So, when people say that there was no record of any Hindu response to the Muslim invasions and that these were exaggerated later on by communal Hindus, they are not aware of these facts that the Hindu king is taking the title of Kodan Ram, other Hindu kings are calling themselves Ram Avatars, then they are commissioning works of dharma to reinforce the need for dharma when they feel that it is under stress. So, these are very important aspects of our culture, our history, our civilizational journey which normally does not get covered in when we talk about the Ram Janambhumi issue, but these are very, very pertinent because they show that the dispute had a history. It is not that the dispute started when uh, certain political parties or religious organizations took up the debate in the 20th century. We can trace this from much earlier right from the time when the Turkish invasions actually begin. So, this is something that is mostly missing in uh, the discussion. Now, what is also very important to note is that well before the Janam Bhumi issue came up in the 20th century, we have records of Hindu kings trying to reclaim their sacred territories, their sacred cities, their sacred spaces. As early as 1751, there is a report that the Maratha leader Malha Rao Holkar was threatening to destroy the masjid that Aurangzeb had made and reinstate the Kashi Vishwanath temple. So, imagine in 1751, they are trying to reclaim Kashi Vishwanath temple. Then we have uh, the Peshwa uh, Balaji Bajirao in 1759, he instructs his agent in Delhi that please negotiate with the Nawab of Awadh for the return of Banaras, Ayodhya and Prayag to the Hindus. In 1772, Madhav Rao, he was a Peshwa, he died at a very young age, he left behind a will. In that will, he told his successor, please struggle to reclaim Hindu sacred cities and places. Then among the most interesting examples of attempts to reclaim Hindu spaces is of the Jaipur ruler Savai Jai Singh. Now, Savai Jai Singh, he came at a time when Aurangzeb had passed away and the Mughal empire was in serious trouble. So, wherever he was posted, he would set up 45 townships which he would call Jai Singh Puras. So, that was one way of strengthening the community. And the other thing that he did was that he purchased land at the sacred cities of the Hindus and established Jaisingh Puras there also. 
he established jaisingpuras for example at uh, mathura banaras ayodhya prayag and many other places the savai mansingh city museum in jaipur it has a lot of records which are relevant for the ayodhya dispute these records show that in uh, 17 17 17 17 jay singh had purchased the land on which the janam sthan stood from the moguls and it was given in perpetuity to the dt so there is i mean if detailed research is done then we will find such evidence from many other sacred cities of india but in ayodhya i mean we see this records in the time of jay singh there are very very detailed records in persian in the record uh, in the museum which show how he was taking over the land buying it from the moguls so the janam sthan stood actually on territory which he had purchased and given in perpetuity to the dt this was in 1717 now to come to ayodhya the sacredness of the city of ayodhya and the hindu attachment to them to it is we have eye witness accounts of the medieval period written by foreigners the first account is by an english traveler william finch who came to india between 1608 and 1611 that means he came around 80 years after the destruction of the masjid by babar now he goes to ayodhya and he finds that there are he finds the revenants of the city and he finds brahmins inside what he calls ram's castle he said ram's castle is in ruins but there are brahmins over there and they record the names of all people who come to take a holy dip in the saryu river he is witnessing this but he makes no mention of hindus performing namaz now this is very significant because are we to believe that the masjid was abandoned sometime after its construction it's a possibility because in 80 years after babar this person is visiting and he does not mention muslims performing namaz over there the second uh, visitor we have is an austrian jesuit joseph joseph tiffenthaler he visits avad between 1766 and 1771 now what he sees he says that it is amazing that i find hindus coming and worshiping at a vedi or a cradle which we now know as ram jabutra he says they come there they offer make their offerings and they move around that place and so he is very struck by this hindu devotion and he notes this ram jabutra and he also makes no mention of namaz so these are two important eye witness accounts of foreigners who are visiting ayodhya in the early 17th century and the mid 18th century which talk about hindus actually present there worshiping that area but they don't talk about muslims offering namaz now this testimony of tiffen thaler about a ram chabutra and a sita ki rasoi the high court the alabad high court it asked the pro muslim pro babri parties that when did these structures come up these structures could not have been part of the original temple and left there because the entire premises was going to be demolished it's inconceivable that they were part of the original temple and left there so the court said obviously they were constructed later perhaps at a time when the masjid was abandoned and they reflected the hindu desire to establish places of worship as close as possible to the temple site now what is the case against the babri masjid interestingly uh, there is a detailed record of judicial cases pertaining to ayodhya right from 1858 onwards now you will uh, recall that ayodhya was annexed in 1856 and in 1857 there was the great 
mutiny. So, the British actually uh, get into the government on the administration of Ayodhya only in 1858. So, from 1858, we have detailed records of disputes between the Muttawalli Babri Masjid and the Mahens of the Janamsthan. The first record that we have is of uh, November 1858. It is a report that is filed by the Thanedar of Abad. He files a complaint and he says that one Nihang Sikh from Punjab, he has entered the masjid and he has started Havan and Puja for Guru Gobind Singh and he has also set up a flag for Shri Bhagwan and there are 25 other Sikhs with him. Two days after this report by the Thanedar, we have the Muttawalli himself appealing to the British. He files a report and he says that this Nehang Sikh has entered the masjid, he has lit fire and started Haban and Puja and all over the walls of the masjid, he has written Ram and Ram. So, Ram Ram has been written all over the walls of the masjid by this Nehang Sikh. Now, this is the first individual document pertaining to Ayodhya. There is no question of disputing the authenticity of this document. Allahabad High Court said this document is very important because it is proof that the Hindus were praying inside the masjid and also in the structures Ram Chabutra and Sita Ki Rasui outside the masjid, but within the um, complex of the Babri Masjid. So, this was very important and this uh, Mutawalli in his complaint, he also says that outside the Jama, outside the Babri Masjid, but within the compound, there is Janamsthan. Janamsthan is lying desolate for hundreds of years and Hindus come and offer praise there. So, he is complaining that Hindus have come inside the masjid and written Ram on the walls and are doing Havan and Puja and outside the masjid, but within the complex, there is Janamsthan where the Hindus have been coming and praying. So, this shows, according to the high court, made, it made note of this, that there is evidence from 1858 of Hindus worshipping inside and outside the complex. This would not have been possible if the entire complex was in Muslim hands. So, at least certainly from 1858, we have the earlier two references by the foreign visitors who do not mention namaz and here we have a complaint by Muttawalli Babri Masjid in 1858 in which he is complaining of worship inside the mosque, but admits that worship outside it has been going on for a very long time. After this complaint of 1858, there are many, many documents which are presented in the Allahabad High Court of litigation between the two parties. The two parties means Muttawalli Babri Masjid and the Mahens of Janamsthan. There are so many cases that it is not possible for me to refer to all of them, but I would like to refer to one or two interesting cases. The first one pertains to the year 1882. In this complaint, the Muttawalli says that for a long time, at the time of Karthik Mela and Ram Naomi, fairs used to be held inside the complex. Shops were put up, land was set aside and he said we had an agreement with the Mahens that we would share the proceeds of the sale 50-50. And he says this year, that is in the year 1882, the Mahens have changed the ratio of sharing the proceeds unilaterally without consulting us. So, he says that he wants his equal share from the shops, flower shops, prashad shops and other shops that are set up on land inside the complex for the time, for the Karthik Mela and the Ramna festivals. So, this is another proof that Hindus had free access to the premises of Babri Masjid. Then uh, the court that heard this dismissed the case because they said the Mutawalli has not been able to prove that he deserves 
what, what is he claiming ground uh, this uh, share for for because the chabutra he is saying is with the mahant and he is not able to prove that he is the owner of the whole complex so they said you don't have any right to claim uh, the rent or share of the sales so your case is dismissed then uh, the other case that i would like to refer to is a, a complaint it's not a complaint but it was a plea made by the mahant of the ram chabutra in 1885 he said the ram chabutra is open ground so we priests we have to sit on uh, we are there in summer there is no protection in the rainy season there is no protection and in the cold there is no protection so he appeals to the british that on this ram chabutra can i make a small temple three uh, levels of the judicial uh, judiciary hear his case in every case they say that he has a very valid argument and uh, he is certainly in charge of the he owns the ram chabutra and he had attached a map with his plea and that map showed that the masjid is in the uh, occupation of the muslims the ram chabutra sita ki rasoi and the outer compound is in his hands now the three british uh, judicial officers who hear it in three stages they say that he has a case they admit that he has a case but they say that you know it's a very sensitive issue and we would not like to disturb the status quo but they don't dispute that he has a right he sh- should be given the right to construct over ram chabutra that ram chabutra is in his possession but they say that any change can trigger off communal tensions and that's why they say that we allow the status quo to continue then there were riots in ayodhya in 1912 and 1934 in the riots in 1934 the babri masjid was badly damaged a letter by the mutawalli babri masjid uh, in november 1943 reveals that at that time only friday prayers were being offered not daily namaz was not being offered then in 1948 december 1948 the commissioner of waqf he files a report and he says that it is the hindus and sikhs are making it very difficult for the muslims to offer namaz in babri masjid two weeks later he files another report in which he says that the masjid is mostly locked and uh, it is only open for a few hours on friday to clean and to offer namaz after that it is locked again and he says that uh, the sikhs and the hindus there are so many of them over there that the muslims also feel frightened of going there so he admits that very uh, only friday prayers are offered and the masjid is open only for a couple of hours on friday so the alabad high court says that these are admissions that continuous namaz is not happening in the masjid but also that the hindus have free access to the complex and there is nobody who can stop them and they are coming in and going out whenever they want and their continuous presence on the site is uh, proved by these reports now uh, the pro babri group they were not able to offer any proof of continuous namaz after 1934 actually there's been a dispute about continuous namaz right from the time of william finch but certainly there is the report by this waqf commissioner who himself says that only friday prayers are offered so 1934 there is no proof of continuous namaz after 1934 in fact when the case was filed uh, then the sunni waqf board only did not file a case for possession of the property it only filed a case that we want a declaration of the status of the property uh, so that was one point and second point is that after the placement of the idols un- under the central dome in 1949 after that there have been no namaz in any case so they are not able to pre- 
prove continuous namaz from the time of William Finch, certainly from the time of the 1934 rites, they themselves admit that we have the record, we have that statement, we have that uh, document by the Waqf Commissioner who says after 1934 namaz is offered only on Fridays. And we do know that from 1949 onwards, no namaz has been offered at Babri Masjid. Now, uh, about the archaeological finds at Ayodhya. From the time of Joseph Tiffin Teller, uh, we have many visitors to the site talking about 15 black stone pillars which are used in the construction of the masjid. Uh, this has been, we have many reports to say this. This has been uh, questioned by uh, many left historians, uh, but I will come to that later. Uh, and over the period of time, many, many uh, pieces of Hindu temple architecture have been recovered from the site. In 1992, when the ground was being leveled, lots and lots of uh, architectural remains of Hindu temples were recovered and the UP uh, State Archaeology Department submitted a list of over 260 finds which were remnants of temples which had been recovered from that site. When the demolition took place on 6th December 1992, many, many more things came out, but the most important was the inscription 5 foot by 2 foot, which showed clearly that a temple had existed at that site. But it is surprising that even this massive proof was not sufficient to convince the left and the left started saying that this inscription was actually not recovered from the site, it was brought to the site from outside. Uh, they said first they said it had been kept in a private collection and was brought from a private collection and because there was so much confusion on 6th December they were able to smuggle it in from outside. Then they modified their opinion later on. First they said it had come from a private collection, then they modified their opinion later on and they said that actually it had been stolen from the Lucknow Museum. It had been stolen from Lucknow Museum and something else substituted over there and this inscription brought. So that was of course, there is no need to get into that, uh, to carry out excavations at that site to determine whether uh, Babri Masjid had been built on vacant land, which is what the Muslims had been saying, or whether a structure had existed at that site. The archaeological survey of uh, India uh, carried out the excavations because there was so much tension on this issue, they followed very strict guidelines. All the excavations would be carried out in the presence of representatives from all parties and the findings each day would be recorded in a register that would be signed also by the representatives of each party. But we find that when evidence of Hindu temple uh, remains began to appear, then many times the left archaeologists refused to sign those daily registers. Now, what did the excavation, what did the excavations of the ASI prove? they showed continuous occupation of that site from the second millennium BC. Among their other finds was a circular shrine dated to the 7th to the 10th century AD. Uh, it had been damaged, but it still contained that pranal, that water chute from which water can flow. Then from the 10th, 11th century, they found the remains of a big structure. On that big structure in the 12th century, the massive, a massive temple was built. That temple remained in existence from the 12th to the 16th century and it was over that temple that Babri Masjid was built. The Babri Masjid was built with full knowledge of the structure below. The walls were added to the walls of the temple, there was no foundation walls, no, it, they, they were just piled on. 
So, we find that now the left takes a totally new turn. So far it had been saying that the masjid is built on vacant land. As evidence of structure below the masjid began to surface, they changed their stand and they said that there is an Eidga or a Kanati mosque below Babri Masjid. So, the court said that all this time you had not made this claim. All this time you had said that Babri Masjid was built on vacant land. Now, when the excavations are revealing remnants of structure below the masjid, you are coming up with this new theory that there is a Kanati mosque or an Eidga below Babri Masjid. So, that is as far as the archaeological evidence is concerned. Uh, now, I would like to talk about the revenue records. Uh, from Ayodhya, we have the revenue records from 1861 onwards. And these revenue records are also very interesting. They reveal from the time of the first regular settlement done in 1861, they reveal that the land had been declared as Nazul or government land and that had not been challenged by anybody. And the Mahens of Babri Masjid were shown as under proprietors of the entire Janmasthan complex. So, that is also significant that in the revenue records, there is no reference to Babri Masjid. And these records are still there. Then there is another damning evidence and that is that no waqf was ever created for Babri Masjid. Now, in 1944, the UP government ordered the publication of the uh, Sunni waqf properties and the Shia waqf properties. And these were printed in the UP Gazette of 1944. There were four columns which, which had to be filled in. And in the case of Babri Masjid, the last column, which was the column for identifying the waqf which was support, to support the masjid, it was left blank. So, the court asked the pro-Muslim parties, why is this column blank? And they were not able to offer any explanation of why the last column was blank. And the court said, the inability to show that any waqf had been provided for Babri Masjid is a fatal flaw in the arguments of the pro-Babri group. On the other hand, so there is no waqf for Babri Masjid, but on the other hand, the Hindu Dharma Shastras were very clear that a temple property could never be lost. Katyayan said that even if strangers have enjoyed a temple property for hundreds of years, that can never be lost to Hinduism. In, in the case of Islam, a site is not sacred. In the Ismail Faruqi versus the Union of India case, the Supreme Court said that a no mosque is not an essential part of the practice of the religion of Islam. Mosque is not an essential part of the practice of the religion of Islam. They say that is, uh, namaz can be offered even on open ground. So, a uh, site has no sanctity for Islam, but Hindu worship is centered around sites and symbols. Uh, the last point that I would like to make is that from the time that the courts began to hear the case, that is from 1950 onwards, from 1950 to 2010, many courts and many judges have heard the Babri case. And it is important to note that the Hindus have not lost even one case from 1950 to 2010. Every court case has gone in their favor. So, where does this leave the proponents of Babri Masjid? The Hindu presence at that site is attested by William Finch in 1608. There is evidence of Ram Chabutra by Joseph Stephen Teller between uh, 16, who toured Abad between 1766 and 1771. There is evidence of Puja and Havan in the Masjid premises by the Mutawalli in 1858. There is extensive record of litigation between 
the Mahens and the Mutawalli. There are reports of the Waqf Commissioner saying it is impossible or very difficult to offer namaz and Friday namaz is being offered with great difficulty from 1934 onwards. There is no evidence, there is no namaz in any case from 1949. So, where does all this leave the Babri case? It is, I leave it to the viewers to decide.